ladies and gentlemen, welcome. Uh, I think this is the most oversubscribed session in Davos. There are 135 people on the waiting list. Um, so thank you for joining us and glad you got some seats. Um, we are here to talk about something uh, that Ray Dalio subscribes to, which is that globalization is dead, um, with somebody who I think can probably challenge that opinion uh, in a pretty convincing fashion. It's a huge pleasure to have on the platform Tom Friedman, journalist, author, columnist, and uh, probably one of the most, uh, you know, the touchstone for commentary in the 21st century. So great pleasure to have you with us, Tom. Okay. Thanks for joining. And, um, you know, we've heard this from Ray, We've heard it from a number of business leaders. You know, globalization has been crumpled up and thrown into the bin. Uh, is it a little early to be dancing on the grave of globalization? Well, um, first of all, great, great to be with you, Adrian. Thanks for having me. I'm sorry, Ron, I couldn't be here. Um, uh, I suspect ever since the first tree fell in a pathway used by Paleolithic um, uh, hum uh, Homo sapiens, um, somebody wrote on a tablet, globalization is over. Um, uh, here's a news flash. People want to connect. It's wired into us. And the technology every month makes it easier to connect. Girls just want to have fun. <laughs> globalization is, is, is wired into us as human beings. Um, it is not linear. It's curvilinear. It goes up and down. Um, but um, I have to tell you, just since I've been writing about it, Google after 9-11, globalization's over. Why can we have globalization when people are flying planes into buildings? building? Google after 2008, globalization's over. The whole financial, global, the global economy melted down, globalization's over. Now, now we hear it again, you know? Um, there's a library of books telling me the world is not flat. It's spiky, it's lumpy, it's curvy, it's humpy. Um, get over it, okay? Um, uh, if World War I didn't stop globalization, if World War II didn't stop globalization, what makes you think the war between Ukraine and Russia is gonna stop globalization when in fact it's actually the first world war? Not World War I, not World War II. This is the first world war. Two thirds of the world's following it on a smartphone. So um, uh, I, I just find the whole notion preposterous, but. But let me drill down a little deeper and, and, um, uh, and explain why. And it's not like I have, look, I, I just have to remind people, I didn't do this, I promise you, okay? I just wrote a book about it, all right? And, um, uh, and I wrote a book about it because I couldn't understand the world as a foreign affairs columnist without it, you know what I mean? Now what I find is that in the, 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 the nature of journalism is such that if you say anything positive about anything, if you have any optimism bias about anything, you're treated as a utopian. I'm described as a techno-utopian, okay? Um, I was just describing the conditions that were allowing globalization to take a different stage. And my view is always it had upsides, it had downsides. And our job as the job of politics and geopolitics was to get the upside, more of the upside than the downside. Um, but I do confess that when I see 800 million people grow out of poverty faster than any time in the history of the world, my heart does go a little pitter-patter, okay? That does kind of flo fl float my boat a little bit. But um, uh, for that, you get called a techno-utopian. Now, if you're a pessimist and um, you've written umpteen times that globalization is over, nobody remembers that, okay? So. Um, it's very dangerous to make any positive claim about, about the world. So, um, uh, and, and that you're immediately turned into some you know, dreamy um, uh, utopian. Let me explain though what I think my contribution to the discussion was. Because when we say globalization is over, first of all I have to say, what do you mean by globalization? Do you mean global trade as a percent of global GDP? Do you mean telecommunications? Do you mean um, uh, cargo travel and containers? Do you mean internet? Um, and so to just say globalization is over, all of these are different aspects of globalization. 
Now, what the world is flat was about was the, the claim of the world is flat. I'm actually, I'm not an economist at all. I've taken exactly one course in economics, introductory to economics at Brandeis University in 1973. That's the only economics I know. And, um, uh, and so when, when people accuse me of being a neoliberal, I also, I don't even know what that word means. It never even figured into my book. I'm, I'm, I wasn't making a economic argument. I'm not smart enough to do that. What the world is flat was about was a very simple proposition. If you look at the sweep of history, to act globally, historically, you needed to be a country. Spain, discovering the new world, Vasco da Gama. Then, beginning with the Dutch East India Company, you actually, to, to act globally, you had to be a company, at least, or a country. What the world is flat was about is that we had created a platform, a global economic platform uh, of technology um, uh, uh, and, and, um, and a set of rules that for the first time in history enabled individuals to act globally. That's what, that, was the, that was the core claim of the book. So when I said the world is flat, I wasn't saying we're all equal. I wasn't saying, oh, borders are going to disappear. That was somebody else's book, not mine, OK? What I was saying is something really big happened. For the first time in history, you can now act globally. You could reach farther, faster, deeper, cheaper, in more ways and more days, around more themes and subjects for less money than ever before as an individual. And that's what's new here. And just to finish one last yeah. point while I get this rant all off my chest, um, uh, there are many things Vladimir Putin did not understand about the world. But we, the thing he understood least was globalization. Because in, in a previous book, The World is Flat, in Alexis and the Olive Tree, I actually created a new category. It was based on this platform, but I hadn't sort of defined it yet in the world is flat, um, of what I called the super empowered individual. What I was saying was that this global platform was creating a world where we didn't just have super powers. We were actually spawning super empowered individuals, where individuals could actually act with the power of states. And um, so I wrote Lexus Solitary in 1999, and, the, and my example of a super empowered person I called him a super empowered angry man, was a guy named Osama bin Laden. So I wrote that in 1999. And the reason I wrote it was because the, the Clinton administration, um, uh, when Al-Qaeda blew up the US embassies in Nairobi and Tanzania, Bill Clinton fired 72 cruise missiles at bin Laden in a base in Afghanistan. And I wrote it about it at the time, and I just said, wow, we just fired 72 cruise missiles at a million dollars a copy at a person. We, we've never done that before. We fired 72 cruise missiles at a person. And I said that was the first war in history between a superpower and a super empowered angry man. So when 9-11 happened, I said, oh, I know what this is. This is the retaliation of the super empowered angry man against the superpower. Now let's flash forward to Ukraine. So, because um, uh, this will tie back to the core question. So Putin. Um, thought he was at war with a superpower, the United States acting through NATO and, and buttressing Ukraine. So he fell into what I call my Princess Diana rule. Um, so Princess Diana once observed that the problem with my marriage is that there were three people in my marriage. Putin didn't understand that there were now three people in his marriage. There was the superpower and the super empowered people. And so the superpower imposed all kinds of formal sanctions on Russia. And then the super empowered people went to work. And this is how they did it. So um, they went into TikTok and they saw videos of massacre in Bucha. They posted on their Facebook page. Then they went into Slack and discussed it with their fellow employees at, say, McDonald's. And then they did not ask the CEO of McDonald's. They told the CEO of McDonald's, we are getting out of Russia. And that happened in a 1,000 companies in a space of two weeks. That was the super empowered people. That was individuals acting globally as individuals. And Putin did not under, didn't see that coming at all. And so is globalization over? Not my globalization, that's for sure. Trade may be down, it may be up. I have no idea. I don't follow those statistics. I'm not an economics guy. I'm actually right about power, foreign affairs. That's where I come from. And for me, globalization is not over in the least. One of my takeaways from your book, The World is Flat, was actually 
what you were saying was that the world as a consumer society is becoming more homogenous. You know, the president of the United States doesn't have a better iPhone than you have. You know, someone in Cape Town doesn't have a different Android phone. Well, that's very levelling. It's levelling. And, and also there's a homogeneity to it. You go into a Luckin's coffee in Beijing or Shanghai, it's going to look pretty much like a Starbucks looks in Boston. Um, so actually, that was not my view. But you, it, it's half right in the sense that my view of globalization, and again, it gets to this idea that I'm some techno-utopian. And I but made this very clear in the book. Globalization, it's flat. It goes both ways. It can be incredibly democratizing. We saw it in the Arab Spring, for instance. And it can be incredibly authoritarian, where China uses a globalization system to impose its order you know, on, on its society. It can be incredibly particularizing. I wrote in that book about women partis artisans in Peru who using the internet suddenly had a global market for their artwork that they never had before. And it could be incredibly homogenizing for the reasons you discussed. There's a Starbucks now you know, um, uh, at every beautiful tourist site in the world. And so it's all about how you get the best and cushion the worst. But it goes both ways. And if you think it's all one or, or all the other, that's when you get in trouble. You said right at the beginning, you know, we talked about the kind of rhetoric of globalization is dead, but you said the upsides and the downsides. Is what's dead or dying some of that optimism about globalization? And is there a way, you know, you put some of that optimism back into it yeah. when you wrote The World is Flat, but is there a way to restore some of that optimism now in what looks like a really dark world where we're facing, you know, food shortage, we're facing fuel shortage, we're facing a conflict in Europe the like of which hasn't been seen in decades? Well, again, it's basically against the rules of modern journalism to be optimistic. So if you stick your head out there, it's going to get chopped off. And, um, uh, but I'm an old fart, so who cares? You know what I mean? Um, uh, well, you know, when did you see this before? Through PayPal. Um, PayPal has set up a system. They identified, I think, 200 different and vetted 200 different Ukrainian charities, um, uh, you know, um, empowerment groups, um, rescue organizations. And they set up a system, not only were individuals of 800 million PayPal users could, as individuals, act like USAID and send any amount of money to any of one or all of these groups, but they worked with American Express so you could cash in your rewards miles and send a donation to an NGO in Ukraine. Was your grandmother doing that in World War I? I don't think so. So again, that, that kind of floats my boat. You know, I'm really sorry for being optimistic about that. But that's amazing. You can cash in your rewards miles as an individual to make a donation to strengthen a Ukrainian NGO against Russia as an individual. Or, as we saw in the first week of the war, someone at Airbnb said, you know what? I'm going to rent a room in Lviv um, from someone on Airbnb. And I'm not going to go. I'm just going to transfer money to that person. And within two weeks, $20 million, before, before AID had laced up their shoes, individuals around the world had transferred $20 million through a what? Global platform in a flat world to Ukraine. I guarantee you that was not in Putin's pre-war planning. Now, does it, does it trump everything Putin's doing? No, but these are, these are enormously exciting things. And to even mention it, you become a techno-utopian. Last night we heard from some of the Ukrainian MPs who are here and they were talking about how they'd used Booking.com to solve refugee issues. Absolutely. To Airbnb find space. Uh, yeah, exactly. So quite incredible. Yeah. Um, we don't have long with you, I know, and we have a great room. Oh, so I, I wanted to fine. see if face. we could get some questions from our audience. Um, so if you can show a hand, uh, then we can get a microphone to you. And uh, just if you could introduce yourself briefly. Gentleman just in the middle there. And excuse me if, you, if I'm not seeing you, I'm faced with a bank of light, so give, give it a good old palm up. Uh, Thomas, uh, my name is Peter Holmes, a from the Australian Financial Review. Friend shoring or ally shoring, so trading with only those that we like. Can you talk about that in the context of what you've been talking about? Um, explain a little more what you mean by that. The idea, that the idea that nations choose who they will trade with, with yeah. based on whether those countries meet share their values or share their values yeah, yeah. and whether it's that's a good thing or whether right. trade actually helps bring good values to countries right so that's a much debated subject it's a very interesting question and it's much debated um 
in Lexus and the olive tree, I, I coined a term that I called globolution. So, um, uh, and it was, uh, the, I defined it as revolution from beyond. That is when you can't get um, uh, uh, reform and political change from below, and you can't get it from above, sometimes you get it from beyond. And what I pointed to was China importing global accounting standards that they couldn't generate from below or above, but because they wanted to do business with Australian companies or have Australian companies work in China, you get the revolution from beyond. And, um, uh, and it's, it's interesting, we um, are just doing a, a roundup, the New York Times, they ask every columnist to write about something they got wrong or that they've reconsidered. And I did actually China, because um, I wrote in Lexus and the Olive Tree that um, uh, I, I, had, I wrote two things. One, that China um, is gonna have a free press, um, the leaders just don't know it. And my argument was that without free and, and accurate information, it, could, it would always be a limit on its growth. And the other thing I said was that my, my, my grandmother, because China was claiming it was going to take the 21st century, you know, and I said, my, my grandma used to say, never cede a century to a country that censors Google. It was a little thing grandma used to say. And, um, <laughs> and so, um, you know, my belief is that censoring Google is a proxy for restricting people's imagination so that it would always be a, a limit. And so, um, uh, and so I confess this, I, I, I got these wrong. But I said, uh, uh, so I plead guilty, Your Honor, but I'm asking for a 10-year suspended sentence. Because who declared 2022 the end of history? And I think we're in a really interesting moment right now with China you know, uh, on this. And, and so I think it's really dangerous to, to make any of these statements. You know, the globalization's dead. It's the end of history. I mean, you know, uh, people don't realize, you know, I, I actually wrote The World is Flat in 2004. Do you realize when I wrote that book, Facebook didn't exist? Twitter was still a sound, the cloud was still in the sky, 4G was a parking place, LinkedIn was a prison, applications were what you sent to college, big data was a rap star, and Skype was a typographical error. <laughs> All of that happened after I wrote The World is Flat. And people are telling me globalization is over. And I've been at all these Ukraine meetings. The amount of innovation the Ukrainians overnight have generated um, to help their people internally, to, I mean, people, globalization is over. There's a Ukrainian parliamentarian. The Russians' first goal was to take down the a terrestrial internet in Ukraine. That was, that was job one. And a Ukrainian MP tweets at Elon Musk, God, we could use some Starlink here. And three weeks later, there's 130 Starlink pods in Ukraine, and they're up and running, and Russia can't do anything. And globalization is over because somebody's trade is off this year or their foreign investments and their fund is down? I mean, I'm sorry, you know, who gave them ownership of this phenomenon? If it isn't a human phenomenon, what is it? So stare out and just see if I can get a question from the gentleman just there. Hi, Neil Lehmer, Tuane Hub Global Shaper. Um, I love the idea of writing about something that you were wrong about before. What do you think is the I biggest... I can fill the whole book, so it's... Go ahead. So I'm going to ask you to make a prediction. Please, yeah. If you are wrong about your view now, what do you think is the most likely thing that would have caused that? What are you most concerned about? It's a very good question. So um, uh, I'll go back to a previous book that I, that I wrote, um, uh, and that was Lexus and Olive Tree, which, if, if, um, uh, if you permit me a moment of narcissism, I think was my most important book. Um, now it was written in 1999, so it was written right at the end of the, after the fall of the Berlin Wall. And at that time, there were four big claims kind of made of what will be the international system that replaces the Cold War system. That's what we're all asking ourselves. Frank Fukuyama said it would be the end of history, the triumph of free markets and, and, uh, uh, and liberal political system. By the way, I'm a huge fan of Frank's. And I, I take my, my view of Frank is sort of my view on something. He may be, he may be you know, uh, he may have been early, you know, but not entirely wrong. And, and so I'm, I'm not ready to, but, but at the time, certainly, it certainly hasn't come about. The second was Sam Huntington. He said it'll be a clash of civilizations. Oh, really, like uh, Ukrainians fighting Russians? I mean, that's a clash. If there's ever been a clash within civilization that's tipped over the world, it's that. This is not a clash of civilization. This is Slav versus Slav. Or how about Iraq versus Iran? I mean, Sunnis versus Shiites. That, that really didn't work. That didn't hold up at all. Uh, the third was um, uh, Robert Kaplan wrote a book called... Um, of the coming anarchy. The world's just gonna get anarchic. He may be right. I mean, I think he's, 
the, the worst you could say, he's, he's early, but um, who knows, that may be right, but it hasn't been. So the book I wrote was Alexis and Alatria. My argument is that actually what will be the defining feature of international relations is gonna be the interaction between these really wired old urges, I call it our olive tree urges, our quest to build solidarity around sect, tribe, family, region, state, religion, nationalism, uh, the things that anchor us, our olive trees, interacting with a world increasingly defined, defined and tied together by this globalization system. And international politics would be this constant rubbing of these two things together. Occasionally, our olive tree urges would burst right through. Um, Putin would take Crimea. Um, uh, and then he would make this move toward you know, Kiev and then get beaten back you know, in, in part by the globalization system. But to me, that's the system now. It's the interaction between what's really old and this new thing. And it takes different forms all the time. And, and that, was, that was the argument I, I, I was making. And the title of the book actually came, I was in Tokyo. I'd gone to the Lexus factory in 1994 in Toyota City, and it was the first fully roboticized car factory. And I was just blown away. I'd never seen a roboticized car factory before, it was 1994. And this little thing where I would put the glue around, your hot molten glue around the, the front windshield, and at the end, the, the little finger would come over and there'd be a drop of glue on it, and a wire would come along and snip it off. It was just amazing. I was wild. Got back on the bullet train to drive back to Tokyo from Toyota City, and I was reading the Herald Tribune, and they had a story in there about how Margaret Tuttle had misstated some UN resolution on Palestine in 1948. And I just thought, you know, these people who I'm riding on their bullet train um, are building the greatest luxury car in the world with robots. And these people in page three of the Herald Tribune, who I love so dearly, who I know so well, are still fighting over who owns which olive tree. And ain't that the post-Cold War world? That's where it came from. Great reflection. I'm just going to look out and see if I can wisdom of crowds for a final question before we... Alec? Uh, Alec Hogg from Business News in South Africa. I, I need help from you on this because I can't understand it. The Ukrainians tell us that the Europeans are, by buying gas, are funding Russia to have a war with Ukraine they're getting, Russia gets more money from, buy, uh, from selling its gas than Ukraine, uh, sorry, than, than it's costing Putin right. to wage yeah. the war. Yeah. It, it seems it's even like better it's than a, that. Putin starts a war and prices go up, you know, and so he actually sells, has to sell half the oil to make the same income um, in a war. Look, we, we specialize in America since 1973 of funding both sides in every war. Uh, that's what we do, you know. Um, we fund the U.S. military through our tax dollars, and we fund the other side through our energy purchases. And um, uh, you know, I wrote about this uh, for the umpteenth time, you know, a, a few days ago, because um, you know that's that's you know, it's. I'm told I don't know this by experience, but I'm told that if you if you jump off the top of a hundred-story building, you can think you're flying for 99 floors. Okay, <laughs> it's the sudden stop at the end that tells you you're not. Okay, <laughs> and so you can launch a war with Ukraine and but and think you're flying, but you know if you don't. It's all the underlying plumbing, you know. In that sense, I mean, it's a real Marxist. I believe it's the underlying, if you don't understand the underlying substructure of, of globalization, telecommunications, energy, or whatnot. And, um, uh, and so you get in these situations where you're funding both sides in war, and that's where we are. Now, um, the, the interesting question here, and I, I would argue we're in the sumo stage of this war now. So it's like, now it's, it's like two giant sumo wrestlers, and each trying to get leverage on the other, you know. And um, with Russia, it's the pure weight of manpower and just dumb bombs, you know, against a pretty defenseless um, uh, urban population spread out around Ukraine. Uh, for the West, Ukraine, and NATO, it's um, uh, this massive sanctioning of the Russian economy by both superpowers and super empowered people. And we're just sort of seeing, you know, now who, who will be able to generate the most leverage. And, um, and oil will be part of that. The problem with oil is that, you know, oil and energy is a scale problem. So if you don't, I mean, if you don't have scale, you have a hobby. You know, I like hobbies. I, I used to build model airplanes as a kid. I wouldn't try to change the world energy system as a hobby, which is basically what we do, you know, uh, what we've been doing. Um, and so th there's only one word that matters when you're talking about energy and climate. It's transition. Is transition. If you don't have a strategy for transition to get from small-scale renewables to baseload renewables, 
to get from oil and gas companies to energy companies. Um, and if you think the transition, the critique from me of the Greens is they think the transition is flipping a switch. I tweeted on it. Um, I got the board of my school to disinvest from Exxon. You, you gotta get out of Facebook and into somebody's face if you're gonna really make change, you know. So they have no plan for a transition. The energy companies, they've been selling us the same hogwash since 1973. Oh, Tom, you're right, you're right. We need to do the transition, but right now we need to pump more oil. So that's what they say every crisis. And yeah, you're sure, but we need to pump more oil. So actually we never make the transition at the speed, scope, and scale that we need. Now, hopefully this will help and, and we're getting there. It's moving down the road. I mean, Germany, you know, gets 52% of its energy, uh, electricity from renewables. Had they not a close, shut down almost all 17 of their nuclear plants, they'd be 80% there. That's jumping off the top of a 100-story building and thinking you're flying. So. Um, you, you, if you don't have a scale plan, you, you don't have a plan. And the only way to get scale, there's only one thing as big as Mother Nature, and that's father profit. That's the market. And if you aren't leveraging the market by reshaping it to give it the incentives you want for the outcome you want, you just have a hobby. Tom, what can I say? Thanks for coming and challenging the consensus for us. It's great to have you framing things. Yeah. Great to have you week by week kind of challenging us to rethink. Sorry, Rana. And uh, yeah, we, it's our bad. Rana was double booked by us. So uh, our apologies. But I think uh, we're hoping to bring her back uh, this afternoon for a, for a one on one. But get I her think the other side of the story. We've yeah. all gained a lot from listening to you, and uh, we gain a lot from reading you. So thank so you much. so much. Thank you.